Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new episode of Slash Film Daily for July 6, 2017. I'm Peter Soretta, and today on the show, Brad Oman joins us to discuss a bunch of news, including Sylvester Stallone teasing the return of Ivan Drago for Creed II, a rumor that Samuel L. Jackson may co-star in Captain Marvel, Game of Thrones may have feature-length episodes in its final season, a lot of details on the cast and plot for Fantastic Beast number two. And uh, Sony wants Edgar Wright to make Baby Driver 2. Should he do it? Will he do it? Uh, all that and more. And in the mailbag, we will answer what are the best moments in San Diego Comic-Con history. And today on the show, we have, once again, Bradford Oman, who you know as Ethan Anderton on SlashFilm.com. Brad, how's it going? What is up? Are you ready to talk some movie news? I have never been more ready for anything in my entire life. How was your July 4th? Uh, It was pretty decent. It was nice to get away from all the hullabaloo that is the entertainment world and to go blow some stuff up and have tons of meats. Did you do anything movie or TV related? Uh, I recorded two new episodes of my podcast, which is called Go Flix Yourself on iTunes, so... Uh, keep an eye out for those coming up over the next week or two. Very cool. I've been watching Glow. I finished Glow, um, which is very good, but I wish it was more of a one-hour drama than a half-hour comedy. Interesting. Drama. Okay. Uh, I think when it when it's good, when it's at its best, it's when it hits its drama kind of moments. Um, but I would recommend anybody that's binging this, and it's a, it's a very bingeable show because it's you know half-hour episodes. I would say search Netflix after for the glow documentary, which is based on the real story and the real people, because it's almost like a quasi sequel. You get to see what happened to these people, even though it's the show is a very fictionalized recount of everything. Anyways, let's get into the news. Uh, First up, Sylvester Stallone has been dropping some hints that Ivan Drago might return in Creed two, or more specifically his son, might return in Creed 2. You wrote this up for the site. I did. Um, now, he, he hasn't said anything about Ivan Drago's son exactly, but the teases that he's been posting on Instagram have been images of Dolph Lundgren with Carl Weathers on the set of Rocky Four, as well as uh, another one with Sylvester Stallone as Rocky Balboa. And then he also posted a picture that looks like a Photoshop job that some fan made featuring... Ivan Drago in the ring with Adonis Johnson, a.k.a. Baby Creed, along with uh, Rocky Balboa ringside. And he's not being very subtle about it. Um, You know, he's basically kind of asking, like, whether or not, you know, this should happen. And, you know, basically referencing the idea that Adonis Johnson will eventually come to terms with the legacy of his father, which came to an end uh, towards the end of Apollo Creed's career because Ivan Drago killed him with one final crushing blow in Rocky IV. And it, honestly, I feel like this is maybe like the best approach to have for a sequel because, you know, Ivan Drago killed Apollo Creed, and for Adonis Johnson to come to terms with that, to have to face Ivan Drago, would be pretty intense. But since it's been about 32 years since Rocky IV, I'm not necessarily sure that Dolph Lundgren is in the best shape to get back in the ring. Um, I would feel like it would have to be his son getting in the ring, and Dolph Lundgren would be, you know, his uh, fight promoter, ring- ringside, just like Rocky is. But then again, Carl Weathers, uh, as Apollo Creed, was also on the tail end of his career when he was killed in Rocky IV. So maybe it would work out that like Adonis would face him in that in that, in that shape as well. That's why I suggested his son, because Dolph is almost 60 now. Yeah. and Or by the time they, they film this movie, he'll be in his 60s. And can a guy in his 60s fight a world heavyweight champion? Well, how old was Sylvester Stallone when he came back as Rocky Balboa before they did the Creed spinoff? That's a good question. Well, that was kind of a gimmick of a match, though, wasn't it? Well, yeah, but I mean, that's exactly what this would be, essentially. You know, I mean... The idea of Ivan, Dra- I, Ivan Drago coming back would would be a gimmick in itself, and to have him face off against you know the son of the per- the boxer that he killed, I mean I, I could see that being cool, but I think that 
it would work out much better if it was Ivan Drago's son. Yeah, and Dolph Lundgren obviously has a history with Sylvester Stallone. He was in the Expendable movies. Uh, what, did you like Rocky IV? I did like Rocky IV. You know, I mean, it's it kind of elevates things to a, a bit of a crazy level. Um, but yeah. but I think Ivan Drago is an interesting character as far as like he makes for a very formidable opponent for Rocky. Obviously, um, I think that that the sort of the and um, what's the word I'm looking for exaggerated nature of Rocky Four would probably be dulled down if they were to bring Ivan Drago and maybe his son into the fray for Creed Two, since Creed is obviously much more grounded when it comes to being a, a Rocky movie as a spinoff. So, yeah, I mean, you know, this this is something that could be really cool. I, I think that, you know, having a character like this come into the fray would really be something that challenges Adonis in more ways than one. Certainly with the political nature of the U.S. In, versus Russia, maybe, maybe that could uh, make this uh, rivalry more topical once again. For sure. Okay, also in the news is there's a rumor going around that Samuel Jackson could co-star as Nick Fury in C- Captain Marvel. Um, I'm not even sure that there really is a uh, good source for this. It came from a report from Omega Underground. Um, but it's very possible because, I mean, Spider-Man Homecoming had Tony Stark as a co-star. Uh, I mean, it makes sense. I I mean, I'm, I think that putting a character like this who, you know, is part of the larger Marvel Cinematic Universe helps to, you know, create a more direct link when you're introducing a new character. It gives fans something familiar to latch on to while also giving them something new. I, I can't imagine they'll be using it as a crutch because I would hate to have them run into a situation where we're looking at another Iron Man 2 where Nick Fury got far too much screen time and there was way too much set up for future Marvel Cinematic Universe installments. But I think that if he's used in an effective way, much in the same way that Iron Man is used in Spider-Man Homecoming, it could serve as a, a nice introduction for the character to sort of, um, I don't know, welcome Captain Marvel to the Avengers, which she'll eventually be a part of, and also give us, uh, give her and also the audiences a little bit more of a guide as to who she is. And plus, yeah. they, they both have a military what? background. Oh, yeah, that makes sense, too. When is the last time we saw Nick Fury? I believe it was Age of Ultron. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're right, I think. Um, it, it's interesting because I, I I predict that whatever happens, the events of Avengers Infinity War is going to bring us into Captain Marvel. Like, like either she's created in those events or something. So I'm wondering what would come about in that that could team her up with Nick Fury. But you're right. They're they're both military backgrounds, so that might make sense. And plus, I mean, even though there's no real shield anymore, Nick Fury could easily still be looking for people who would make for good, you know, members of the Avengers. Yeah. The, next in the news, Game of Thrones final season might feature movie length episodes. Uh, our own David Chen was at Con of Thrones, and he was on a panel with sound designer Paula Fairfield. And she mentioned that the season seven finale of Game of Thrones will be 82 minutes long. The final season, they're considering making each episode feature length. I'm not sure if that means like just over 60 or if that means two hour long episodes, but it sounds heavy in in, uh, in scale. Um, I'm not a huge Game of Thrones fan. Do, do you watch Game of Thrones? I do watch Game of Thrones. It's It's funny. I I will not hesitate to watch the new episode, but at the same time, it's not a show where I spend the ent- all the time in between anticipating the next season. Like once it arrives, I'm excited and I'm happy to watch, but I'm not digging through details, rewatching episodes all the time, or you know, reading tons about it. But I'm I'm definitely happy when it gets here. What do you think of having these extended episodes? Because for me, you know, I'm not. I have an a- admission to you guys. It's, it's I, it's not that I'm not a Game of Thrones fan. Like, I really don't like Game of Thrones, and I, I know that's strange because we, we do. <laughs> what? Those two things sound contradictory. They do. I mean, it's fine. It's not like I hate it. It's just I don't understand the overwhelming love. You know, I'm not a fantasy guy, and also it seems like you wait all episode and it's these people speaking at tables at length. 
about all these different families and whatnot. And I don't I don't understand what's going on. You got to listen to a podcast that may or may not be on slash dot com to figure out what's going on. And then then in the last 10 minutes, shit gets real and it gets awesome. Um, so that makes me worry for a two hour episode of Game of Thrones if it's going to be, you know, a lot of that table drama and just like, you know, a 10 minute climax. I don't think that we're gonna we're looking at two hour episodes. I would bet that we're talking somewhere between like an hour and fifteen minutes to an hour and a half. Because I mean, to be considered feature length, I think it just has to be se- over seventy five minutes. I think that's yes, like the minimum I, feature length. So I feel like if anything, it'll just be just a slight extension of episodes, which we have gotten before. And even the the season finale of this coming season is supposed to be eighty two minutes. And yeah. so. If anything, I feel like it's it's something that's good for fans because there will be obviously be a lot of epic stuff happening in the final season, and they've already said that the final season is going to be shorter than the previous season, so they have to still. But that get- makes me wonder why why make the final season shorter and with longer episodes? Why not just make the f- final season the same exact length with one hour episodes? I imagine that there's just not as much of a natural split in the story arcs to allow for episodes that are only an hour long like i bet if, if they plan out the season and if they like they said okay this episode ends after an hour it wouldn't be at a part that was necessarily dramatic enough to actually end it on and so they they have it go longer and it's just there's so much story to fill in that they need that extra time for a single episode look at you brad making some good points um i i once did an article on slash film.com which i'll link in the show notes about how netflix is kind of changing the way television works because you know some of their shows are doing episodes that the lengths like the OA I think the shortest episode of it is under 30 minutes and the big you know longest episodes like an hour and a half or something and it's letting the story determine the length of the time that to tell that story rather yeah. than let let the medium constrain the story so HBO has been doing that for a little bit too but not like to the extent that they have started doing with Game of Thrones. And yeah. So uh, let, let's move on to Fantastic Beasts, uh, the sequel, which is still entitled. They have released some plot details and new cast members. Uh, shooting has begun. You wrote the article on slashfilm.com. Tell us about it. Well, yeah, production just started at Levenden Studios over in London, which is where they shot all of the Harry Potter movies, as well as the first Fantastic Beasts. And Along with the, the announcement of production, they actually announced you know new plot details that lay out in the most general terms what's what's happening. The story picks up a few months after the end of Fantastic Beasts, where uh, Gellert Grindelwald revealed himself to be in disguise as Colin Farrell's character, Percival Graves. Um, however, it seems in the months since the end of that movie, after he was apprehended, Grindelwald escaped. So now they're trying to find him. Albus Dumbledore uh, t- is teaming up with Newt Scamander, played by Eddie Redmayne this time. Uh, Dumbledore is being played by Jude Law. And, of course, the uh, all the other three main characters we met in the first movie are coming back in some form. We're also going – we got confirmation that Ezra Miller is coming back as Credence from the first movie, who apparently survived his encounter uh, with the Obscurus. Zoe Kravitz is back as Letta Lestrange, who does have ties to the famous uh, Dark Wizard Lestrange family in the Harry Potter universe – and as we know, it has some kind of history with Newt's commander. There's also uh, Theseus commander, who is Newt's brother, who seems to be his exact opposite. He's a war hero and an auror. And then there's a character being played by Claudia Kim, who is unnamed, and we meet her as a featured attraction at a wizarding circus. Um, my guess, and I don't know specifically who she's playing, but her character might have some kind of tie to the primary Harry Potter stories that we know about because the press release went out of their way to mention that the sequel would have, quote, some surprising nods to Harry Potter stories that will delight fans of the books and film series. I don't know what that could be. Uh, Perhaps it could be a Hogwarts professor, you know, during their younger years before we met them. Maybe it could be somebody who is in the Harry Potter family or even in another wizarding family. Uh, there, there's plenty of bloodlines within the Harry Potter universe that there could be connections to. And since this is being written by J.K. Rowling, she's bringing her signature world building to these movies. And so even though the movies aren't necessarily quite as good as the actual Harry Potter movies, they're still 
you know, this nice touch there where it feels like there's a lot of meat in this world that we can dig into as as fans of Harry Potter. I wasn't a huge fan of Fantastic Beasts, but I am a fan of Harry Potter and the characters and that in the world and that. And I did like the world of Fantastic Beasts. I'm just hoping that this time around there's more characters for me to, you know, grab onto. Yeah, I agree. I, I was not the biggest fan. I, I didn't hate it, but I also didn't love it. And I think that as it continues, then maybe the story will get a little bit more engaging um, as we learn more, hopefully, and as we lead up to what is supposed to be this big battle between Grindelwald and Dumbledore. On to another sequel, and that sequel is Baby Driver 2. It's funny because last week, a couple weeks ago, I remember seeing articles of you know doubting uh, how much Baby Driver could make. Edgar Wright really hasn't had a huge hit on his hands. And, you know, there was even articles about how if Baby Driver fails, what will it mean to original films and whatnot. And now that Baby Driver has made, what, a total of $35 million at its box office in opening weekend, which is the biggest in Edgar Wright's history as a filmmaker, um, they're already talking about Baby Driver 2. <laughs> um, you wrote this article on SlashFilm.com. What do we know about this? I mean, basically, Edgar Wright said in, in a podcast appearance for Empire Magazine that Sony has asked him to think about doing Baby Driver 2, and he said that it's something that he's considering just because he thinks the title character, played by Ansel Elgort, does end up in this different place at the end of the movie. And and we, we, we should be careful about spoilers here. Yeah, I won't spoil, I won't spoil anything yeah. if you haven't seen Baby Driver yet, but basically... Uh, he thinks that he has a story idea that puts Baby in a different position that kind of uh, puts a little bit of a twist on where we found him in the original movie. Um, rather than being uh, part of this criminal underworld, he's, sort of, he's no longer an apprentice. He's kind of like above that somehow. And he didn't go into specifics as to what that meant or you know what the story might be or anything like that, but it's clearly something he's thought about. And I got to be honest with you, I'm, I'm a little torn as to whether or not I want this to happen. Because as much as I love Baby Driver, and I really did love it, I feel like the movie sort of works on its own as a story that has a clear beginning and end. And the ending itself ha has a bit of ambiguity to it, to where if a sequel came along, you would have to answer what the ending actually means. And yeah, and on, uh, and on your article in SlashFilm.com, you can go read Edgar Wright's quote, when he was asked about the interpretation of the ending, if you want to find out what he had to say about that. Yeah. And I, I'm just not sure that you can expand upon it enough to, in a satisfying way to make it worth continuing the story. I, as much as I would love to see Edgar Wright do this incredible thing where he harmoniously syncs music with the visuals of his film, I just don't, I'm not necessarily sure that it's the best idea for this to be the movie that gets a sequel when, you know, I would much rather see a Hot Fuzz sequel. I, I think I'd much rather see a sequel to almost any one of his movies except for World's End. Yeah. If it happens, I'll be first in line to see it, but I'm just not necessarily sure that it's something that I, A, want or B, need. Yeah. I, I would like to see him jump full into, like, an actual musical. The, some of the best parts of Baby Driver are that, like, opening two sequences where the choreography to the music in the cinematography, it's all like a couple steps away from being a musical. And I, yeah. I want to see him get to that, go, go up two steps. I want to see what an Edgar Wright musical would be because I know people love La La Land. I, I really liked La La Land, but I think an Edgar Wright musical, an all-out musical, would blow that away. Yeah, I think that would be incredible to see. So that's all we have in the news. We're going to go right to the mailbag where we answer a question sent in by one of you listeners. You can send your questions to peter at slash film.com and we will try to get to the more interesting questions. I can't guarantee you we'll get to all of them. If you send a question, please send in your name and your basic geographic location so we can mention that on there. Uh, today's question was sent by Robert Malone who asked, could you guys discuss some of your favorite moments from the past San Diego Comic Cons. You guys cover San Diego Comic Con in an awesome way, and I would love to hear some of the cool things you have seen. And this is actually one of the guys that we stood in line with at Hall H last year, by the way, Brad. Oh, um, cool. Robert Malone. Uh, so uh, how long have you been going to Comic Con? 
this coming year will be my eighth one, I think. It will be my 11th. My first one was the Iron Man Comic-Con. So I feel like I grew up with Comic-Con with Marvel in the Marvel you know, Cinematic Universe. The first Comic-Con I was at um, was that, that panel in 2007 where Jon Favreau showed up and surprised with some Iron Man footage where they were not that far into production, I think, of, of the film. I remember that being uh, pretty big. I remember 2007. Were you there when the Dark Knight viral was going on? No, I was not. I was. Uh, I happened to still be in college, but I was following it closely from the cubicle of my office at Purdue University, where I was going to school. <laughs> yeah, that was, uh, Christopher Nolan didn't show up at Comic Con with the Dark Knight that year, but the presence was felt all over the place. People were running around with Joker masks, and there were there was this whole scavenger hunt that I, I forget what the payoff was, but it was. I remember it being pretty awesome. And you know what the, the thing for me, Brad, is about Comic-Con, a lot of these studios, like I talked to some of the people from studios and they're like, we don't have the footage or we don't want the footage to come online and get online or what, you know, we don't, whatever. A lot of these moments that are my favorite in, in Comic-Con history aren't really predicated on footage. Could be as much as, what are some of your favorite moments? No, I think I I agree. Like it's a lot of it comes from the experience. Um, one of my favorite ones was actually my my first Comic Con was um, when they re- they really finally made the official announcement that Tron Legacy was going to be a real thing, and like they played the the yeah, teaser. Well, that, that was a surprise trailer. It was at the end of yeah. like a uh, race to which mountain presentation. But then th- this was the second one they did when they like officially like they had like an actual uh, a better. I guess presentation of as far as like teasing the the announcement of it and everything. Well, but one my favorite thing was that they had a Flynn's arcade set up, yeah, act, in San Diego, and they they had it set up to where you actually walked through you know Flynn's old office in the arcade, and you had to go through a secret door, uh, and they had they had the actual arcade set up with all these old school arcade cabinets, and then you when you walk through and essentially got yeah the brought, Tron the Tron machine at the end of it uh, end of the arcade like opened and there was a secret door leading you to Flynn's office where you got zapped with a laser and And then then you you ended up in the the end of line club where you you look like you were essentially in the world of Tron which was really cool and like there was there was ties to the viral stuff that was going on at the time and it was just it was just it's just awesome experience and like this wasn't something that we exclusively got to do because fans were able to do it too you got your little Flynn's arcade tokens to be able to enter, and it was just—it was just an incredible experience. Yeah, and it was open all weekend, so I think tons of people got to do it. Um, one of my other favorites was in 2009, the Lost presentation where they said goodbye to Lost. It wasn't really about you know teasing what was coming in the upcoming season. It was, it was Damon Lindelof and Carlton Cuse on stage answering fan questions cryptically, and all the the cast and crew were there in very funny but also emotional ways uh it, it, you can watch the whole panel i think online somewhere probably in my article i have an article called the best moments in hall age history which i'll link in the show notes another one of the moments that i remember vividly was in 2009 james cameron showed up with avatar and he previewed 25 minutes in 3d and that was the first time 3d was in hall h and i remember everybody was blown away say what you will about that movie it was amazing it was pure spectacle in a uh, more recent comic-con history uh one of the coolest things that i got to experience was when they did that surprise star wars concert after the star wars the force awakens panel yeah. back in 2015 uh there was already a cool panel because they had new cast members there and they had Harrison Ford and Mark Hamill and Carrie Fisher all there talking about the movie. They showed the awesome behind the scenes sizzle reel. And then at the very end, JJ Abrams just said, uh, everybody, you know, uh, get up because we're taking you to a special star Wars concert back behind all H. And we were all kind of just looking around in disbelief. Like, can they, is this possible? Like, can they really do this? (laughs) And And sure enough, we all, walked through uh, around hall h down the street to you know the park that's right behind hall h where they have uh, you know they had the orchestra set up which is right on the water it's right on the water 
there was a stormtrooper escort like walking us through through San Diego. And sure enough, we all got lightsabers and they played, you know, a bunch of tracks from John Williams Star Wars score o- over the years. And it was just And there was amazing. fireworks at the end. There was lasers yes. and fireworks. It was, it was I don't think anything is ever going to top that moment for me, honestly. Yeah, no, it was it was an incredible surprise and it was like it's one of those just just once in a lifetime experiences. Yeah, and that doesn't involve a lick of new footage, honestly. Uh you know, before that happened uh, in 2010, there was Scott Pilgrim vs. San Diego, where Edgar Wright had a panel for Scott Pilgrim vs. the World in Hall H and announced that he would be screening the movie for for fans. And he basically just invited everybody in Hall H to follow him, you know, down um, uh, the gas lamp to the movie theater to go see it. They had rented out the entire multiplex. And everybody went – or no, it wasn't multiplex. It was actually a huge uh, – arena i think i don't remember exactly where it was but the cool thing is saw the film when the film ended the movie screen lifted and metric was there to play a small concert of the songs that were in the movie another moment that i recall is in 2010 the avengers cast no footage nothing like literally they brought the avengers cast on stage and they had like nick or samuel jackson introduce each of them and that was when we got the confirmation that Mark Ruffalo was the Hulk. I mean, it's literally a photo op, but it, the excitement in that room. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I actually uh, think that, that they might do that again this year. I have a feeling that they will bring out the entire Infinity War cast because that would be could, insane. Can you, can you fit that cast on the stage? I'm sure they'll figure out how to. There's a bunch of times that stars have me had these really emotional moments. Like, you know, say what you will about the Amazing Spider-Man movies, but I remember Andrew Garfield showed up at the panel dressed in a Spider-Man costume, you know, for the Q and A, and like took off his mask and read this emotional speech, uh, really passionate, heartfelt speech about why. As a Spider-Man fan, he was excited to play this hero. And, I mean, the movie didn't work out that well, but you can see the speech on YouTube. It's amazing. One of the other cool things uh, in Hall H that you really don't get a vibe for unless you're in there is that the first year Warner Brothers completely revamped, like, the screens in Hall H. Usually they have uh, three screens set up so that you can see... The interviews happening on stage if you're not close enough and then also that's where the footage plays when they have trailers and sizzle reels and that kind of thing and in 2012 uh, when the hobbit was still you know on the verge of coming out all of a sudden the curtains along the side walls of hall h just slid away to reveal these massive screens that basically surround the entirety of hall h and they were just all filled they just filled with this huge hobbit banner that you could see all the characters in the movie on it and ever since then warner brothers has been doing that every year where they just they expand the screens and completely take over hall h and just fill it with all this footage and it's it's so cool yeah the 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 hype in that room when that happened as much as that's just like has nothing to do with movies it's just the presentation and the epicness of it was cool in 2014, Legendary surprised us with a teaser trailer for Godzilla. W- one of my favorite moments, honestly, out of all the moments, one of my favorite moments was during a Marvel panel, panel the lights went out, and then they went back on, and Loki, or Tom, uh, Tom Hiddleston as Loki, was standing yeah. on the stage, and he did this whole speech just as Loki, in character, in the crowd, like, was just so into it. It was... So, so much fun. So amazing. And the only other one I would say a big su- surprise was Zack Snyder was there for Man of Steel. And I remember at the end of that panel, he invited um, someone up to to read a, a passage from The Dark Knight Returns. Frank Miller's The Dark Knight Returns. And basically announced that there was going to be a Batman vs. Superman movie. And for a crowd of comic book fans... That is, like, the best you can get. Say what you will about what the movie was. It seems like, going over this, Brad, it seems like a lot of this was uh, over-promising, under-delivering. But the over-promising and being there in the room 
<laughs> it, like, it is, is a high that you cannot beat. No, yeah. I, I mean, you never know really how a movie is going to turn out, but you're excited about the prospect, especially when it comes to adapting material that you are already familiar with. You know, you're, you're finally going to see something that you never thought you'd see on a movie screen come to life. And sure, there are times when it may turn out to be disappointing for some, for, you know, some of us, others may enjoy it, but it's just, it, when you're in that room and the prospect of seeing something you love come to life in a whole new way is, it's so thrilling. For me, the most exciting moments of Comic-Con have been mostly having to deal with surprise or seeing early footage or fun appearance appearances like or, you know, heartfelt real moments like, as well. Like, I feel like th- those are the things to me that makes those makes Hall H such a special place at Comic-Con. Uh, There's so many weird things that happen at Comic-Con, too, because like everywhere you go and everywhere you turn to, like there are. There's somebody that like you're not expecting to see that you could literally just run into. Uh, like one of the weirdest things that happened to me actually was uh, back when Hunger Games was still coming. Uh, Mock- I think it was the first Mockingjay was coming out. They just had the panel for it, and I went over to a press conference they were having to, so that I could see if there was anything else worth covering that would come out of it. And as I was taking the escalator in one of the hotels to where the press conference was going, uh, Kiss, the band Kiss – was behind me on the escalator. And it's like, it's, it's like what, what's even going on here? This is so weird. Yeah, like, what is Kiss doing there? They're probably selling some <laughs> kind of merchandise, something. They were. Entertainment Earth had, like, a whole new Kiss license, and they were there to promote, like, a bunch of stuff that they were selling. Oh, another moment in Hall H that I forgot about is, remember when that guy got stabbed? Or someone yeah, stabbed someone with a pen? I was, like, two rows away from that hap- happening. Like, it was that was, that was insane. And then... Chris Hardwick actually made uh, – did like a little tiny bit about that on one of his st- uh, stand-up specials. Oh, did he really? He, yeah, he actually talked about it. And I remember the panel after that was Cowboys vs. Aliens – or Cowboys in Aliens? Cowboys vs. Cowboys aliens? vs. Aliens. Yeah, it's so forgettable. Or, oh, but I remember aliens. I remember uh, Harrison Ford came onto the stage with handcuffs. And no one got if that was a joke about the guy getting stabbed or whatever. It turned out later that, like – he said he would never go to Comic Con and he was being dragged on stage, but a lot of people took it as a joke about the guy that got stabbed with a pen, and I remember people were upset about that. But Cowboys and aliens. That's what Cowboys it and aliens. <laughs> um, what, what do you think is going to be the the big surprise of this year's Comic Con? The big surprise of this year's Comic Con. That is a very good question. Um, we already know there's not going to be. A Star Wars The Last Jedi panel. I feel like any Star Wars surprises are out of the question simply because D23 is coming before then. And even though D23 is coming before then, I think that Marvel will again take the cake with... I, I Part of me wonders if they'll announce the title for Avengers 4 at Comic-Con because they're they're keeping it a secret for now. I think and, it's a, they've said it's a spoiler for Infinity War, so I feel like they're not going to announce it until after Infinity War. I don't know. You said we might actually get to see the whole cast on stage from Infinity War and I'm sure see, the, see footage from Infinity War, which will probably blow off the roof of Hall H. Yeah, I, Warner Brothers always has a surprise every year. Like they, uh, Kong Skull Island was a, uh, the announcement that that movie even existed was a complete surprise announcement. Uh, whenever whenever that was made, yeah. and so yeah, so Warner Brothers always has something that comes out of left field. I'm sure that they'll they'll be bringing that to Hall H. We'll both be at Comic-Con in San Diego, and I will be f- hopefully filing some daily podcasts from there, some updates. So watch the site, but also listen to the podcast. Where can we find more of your work on the internet, Brad? I'm writing at Slash Film all the time, and you can find me on Twitter at Ethan underscore Anderton. And if you want any more on any of the news stories we talked about on here, go to SlashFilm.com. You can subscribe to this podcast at iTunes, good Google Play, Overcast, or any of the popular podcast apps. Uh, this pop- podcast is published every weekday, so check it out. And uh, we're still mu- very much experimenting with this podcast, so please feel free to send your feedback to us at peter at slash Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>